We're uh, talking to Patricia Muse, uh, independent candidate for... Uh, Actually, unenrolled. Unenrolled, that's unenrolled right, the language of... Uh, the language has changed. Language here in Massachusetts, yes. unenrolled, which I always thought was a, a bad term anyway. Uh, it makes it sound like you're not registered right. to vote. That's exactly what my husband says. He goes, I hate that term. It is. Uh, but unenrolled <laughs> candidate for yep. state representative 19th uh, Middlesex District yep. here. Um, and uh, and longtime member of the Shawshine Tech uh, School Committee. Uh, and so first, thank you for uh, taking the time to, to talk. Oh, thank you for asking me. <laughs> um, I, I suppose the first question, the most obvious question, and probably the one that you have had to answer most is, um, after the, all this time on mm -hmm. the uh, school committee, what made you decide to, to pull the trigger and, and decide to run for state rep? You know, it, actually it's always been one of my little dreams, you know, culmination of my political life that, you know, that I would run, but I would never have run against Jim Maselli. So, you know, it was kind of like, well, if Jim decides to retire, maybe then I'll run. But I was like, oh, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. <laughs> So in this, you know, and when he when he passed away, just terribly sad, and you know everybody started pulling papers, and I'm thinking, do I really want to do it? Oh, you know, I'll give it a shot. You know, I think I can do a great job. I have been, you know, I've been an elected official for 29 years. I, I spent two terms on the Tewksbury School Committee before I went to Shawshine, and you know, and I think people have been pleased with me. So. I think they trust me. I think, you know, and because I'm unenrolled, I'm I actually represent a lot more people than the other two parties. And and my other unique little thing is I grew up in Wilmington. I spent 24 years in Wilmington. I went to Wilmington High School, graduated from Wilmington High School. You know, my parents lived there until they got too sick and we had to move them into my house. So you know, and my five siblings, we all graduated from Wilmington, so that's part of one of my hometowns. And now Tewksbury is my other hometown, so it was representing both hometowns. Tell me about, because I think probably um, when people probably who know you well knew you were mm -hmm. unenrolled uh, as a voter, but uh, when you pulled papers mm -hmm. as somebody who was going to be unenrolled, that right. might have surprised people. Right. Um, Tell me why uh, you decided to uh, to maintain and run as an unenrolled, okay. as opposed to switching Picking over and, uh, and going in one of the main parts. Well, in reality, I had no choice because if I had wanted to switch my party, I would have had to do it months earlier. Oh, I see. But I don't think I would have anyway. I, I like my status. I like being able to vote the issue, vote the person, not a party line. You know, and no matter what the other two candidates say, they'll vote the party line. You know, I mean, I listened to the debate of the Democrats and everyone, you know, they asked each one of them, have they ever voted outside their party? And except for Robertson, who said he made a mistake once, everybody said no. And I'm like, you know, and that's why I'm unenrolled. I vote both parties if I like whichever person I like, you know, or I'll vote an unenrolled person. And, and that's the only issue that I'm really having a hard time dealing with certain people is, you know, they'll say to me, well, now you're taking votes from one of the parties, so it's not really fair. And I'm like, you know, but most of us are unenrolled. Why not get a person like you in the state house? I was going to ask that because we are seeing more and more uh, of that, the, the number right. of unenrolled uh, people uh, dropping party affiliations. Right. And so it really, it does almost seem as though it is a third group uh, as far as a mindset yes. of independence yep. uh, that, uh, that you are looking to, to kind of be a voice for. Right. That's exactly right. That's what I want to be the voice for. It's like, you know... Think of, you know, step out of the box, think about this, vote for someone who actually thinks like you, who, who really votes the issues, who really votes the person, and, you know, and don't be afraid. Don't think it's going to, you know, mess up whatever, you know, they're like, well, you're going to steal, you know, the Democrats, some of the Democrats are going to steal something. 
like, you know what? How about we just stand up for ourselves and say, we're tired of this. We're tired of this potty politics. We're tired about, you know, what's going on and everybody's fighting with each other and hating on each other. Let's say, you know, we are sick and tired of it. We want to just vote hard. We want to vote the person. We want to vote the issues. And that's it. I'll ask you a question that I've mm -hmm. asked all the candidates, right. uh, and, and it's of particular interest with you as an unenrolled. Right. If you get elected um, in that capacity, right. do you feel as though um, you would be able to have the influence needed to really accomplish some things for the district, even though you're not affiliated with, right. with one of the parties? I actually think I have a better chance than at least one of the parties. <laughs> I mean, because... Massachusetts, the legislature is, you know, 75% or more Democratic, you know, and even though, you know, Jim Maselli was a very moderate Democrat and he voted for us and our issues, but you don't get a lot done, you know, unless you vote your party. But I think as an independent or unenrolled in, you know, there are, I believe several, well, not several, but there are a few independents or unenrolled candidates running in Massachusetts, you know? And once we start gaining a little power, we'll we'll do well, you know? And, and you know, and when we want to vote the way the Republicans vote, we'll be able to do that. And when we want to vote the way the Democrats do, we'll be able to do that. And, you know, I mean, it's, I know, some of the things are so sinful to me. I mean, like the pay raises that you know, just went through and every single Democrat voted for them, you know, and because they're the ones who are going to benefit from them because they're in power. And until we change that, and we have to start changing, you know, this party politics, we have to do it. You said during the debate the other night uh, that you tended to be uh, a conservative thinker, conservative right. on the issues. So let's talk about um, uh, state spending and, and, and taxes and whatnot. Are you uh, somebody who, uh, you, would you like to see the size of, of government and government spending uh, shrink, cut down, cut spending? Or is it more a matter of kind of reallocating some of the, the spending that's already being done? Well, taxes in general, I'd like to go down to the 5% that the, you know, the citizens voted for in 2000. But yeah, reallocating the money a little differently. Yeah, I'd like to see that. Uh, and money, I was thinking about this, about people asking if this go conservative or not. Anyone who has known me on the Shawshank Tech board, I remember Charlie would be like, do we have enough votes? Because Patty's going to vote no for this spending. Because <laughs> I always, you know, I was always voting no for extra money. It's like, no, we don't have the money. We, don't, we can't do this, you know. And it's like, so we'd be counting the votes. And I remember that when we were doing the, um, the fields, which was a huge right. issue. And it was, you know, and I was a no until my son came with me to one of the games at the Tech. To, and he's a, um, a teacher, and, well, a phys ed teacher, and a football coach, and a track coach. And he said, oh my gosh, mom, these fields are dangerous. They are dangerous. And I said, okay. <laughs> so when we voted for it, and I voted yes, I see Charlie sigh of relief, like, oh my gosh, I thought you was definitely going to vote no. <laughs> but no, I have always been very fiscally conservative, you know, and, you know, and I was on the school committee during the late 80s, early 90s, when Prop 2.5 really kicked in, sure. and we were asking everyone to take budget cuts, we asked everybody to take payroll cuts, salary cuts, and it was tough, and at that time, you know, my last year in office, I believe it was my last year in office, we really thought the teachers were going to go on strike. But I was on that negotiating team, and there was two of us, I think, and we managed to avoid that strike that year, just negotiating with them. Let's, you know, think about this. The town has no money, you know? And then as soon as I was off, they did go on strike. <laughs> Why has it, it has seemed as though the Shashin Tech School Committee has um, functioned uh, pretty smoothly? 
it seems as though it's a, it's a, and, and which is, you know, you've got a bunch of different towns yeah, represented, towns. Uh, you know, a bunch of different uh, points of view. Mm -hmm. What is it, and I ask this because people will talk about Beacon Hill being dysfunctional. Right. What is it about the, the school committee, uh, the Shawshank Tech School Committee, that has made it be more functional, more productive? I think because we have a good relationship with the superintendent, and it was Charlie, and now it's Tim. And we don't fight over things at a meeting. If there's an issue, we talk, you know, you call a superintendent or you call the chair of the school committee and say, you know, what's going on here? Why, you know, not that we're having a meeting outside, but, you know, you'd call your chair, right. you know, and say, okay, I see this on the agenda. What is it about? And they explain it. If you have a question, you'll get your question answered, whether it's by the superintendent or the chair of the committee. So I think that's it. We figure things out before we get to a meeting. And I don't know if you noticed, our meetings are quite short most of the time. Right, uh, right. And that's you know? kind of what I was alluding to. Right, yeah. because if you have an issue, find out your answers beforehand. Don't do it at a meeting. Don't become a shouting match at a meeting. You know, and you know, I mean, I'll know sometimes going in there because I've asked the questions. I know I'm the losing vote, you know, and I understand that. I mean, I, I get where everybody's, you know, I'll talk to the chair and they said, well, this is what won't happen. Not really for that. I might ask a question or two and I'll vote no. Like the other night, the other night we had an issue where I think it's the first time we had, it was nine members there and it was a 5-4 vote. I don't think wow. I've ever seen that at one of our meetings in the 23 years I've been there. Right. You know, right. so it was like, wow. You know, I mean, but there was no, you know, big argument. You know, we kind of understood where both sides were coming from, and we just voted how we wanted, and we don't, we don't, we don't fight at meetings. You know, it's just pretty civil. One of the one of the big issues that affects so many families is the, yeah. is the, um, uh, the future of public education and okay. improving public education, uh, getting the most bang for the buck. Uh, whether there needs to be more spending, from from the perspective of somebody who's been involved with technical education, mm -hmm. the technical schools have done a great job of attracting um, a lot of the best and brightest students um, in recent years and have really um, improved their overall performance uh, mm -hmm. academically and, and whatnot. It, does that have to do with the offerings of technical education? I, I guess the question being, does public education in general need to kind of broaden the offerings a little bit more and go back to offering some more hands-on type of education that the technical schools are? I, I guess the question, what are you seeing the success with the tech schools have been having? Well, you're right about the regular high schools. They used to be comprehensive high schools, right. even when the techs, you know, were when they were invented or whatever, when right. they came into right. being. And I remember when I was on the Tuxbury School Committee, and I talked to the superintendent one day and he said, well, we're a comprehensive high school because people were suggesting, well, get rid of this, get rid of this. He goes, we're a comprehensive high school because there are students that are not going to get into the tech. I mean, the right. slots are only so many, right. you know, but I would argue the point that uh, about the best and the brightest because that's always been you know, a little stickler thing with everybody. Oh, well, you take the best, or you take the best sports kids, or you take the best this, well, you know? Well, okay, let me ask you a different way. <laughs> okay. The number, of, the number of students who are applying mm -hmm. to has tech increased. schools has increased across right. the board, not just right. to Shashin, but across That's the board. Right. So what would you attribute that to? And do, like I say, do, do, right. do other high schools kind of need to adjust their offerings? Okay, I, I believe, well, I love the education at the tech school. I, I really think, and, and I went to college, I went to law school, I, I would have loved to have gone to a tech school because when you only have, you know, you have one week of academics and one week in something that you really love to do hands-on, you know, I mean, to me that's a perfect thing. And all my children decided that wasn't their perfect thing. And my, you know, I have some grandchildren that go there and some children that go to Tewksbury High. You know, and it is based on the student. But I really didn't like sitting in a classroom all that time. Even though I did well, I really would have liked, because 
you know, I'm done habitat. I love working with my hands. I like to build. I like, you know, so it's a different attraction. And it's also a different, my, well, kind of a different mindset that, you know, let's say you want to be an architect. I remember bringing a couple of, when my daughter was in school, one of my daughters was in school and her friend wanted to be an architect. So we went over to the tech and we looked at all their offerings and my daughter said, no, I don't want to go. And the girl who was doing architect, you know, who wanted to be an architect, I said, look at what you could do here, you know? And I was like, no, we're going to the right. But I think now people have accepted it, you know? And when my granddaughter went, the thought process was, you can get a job in the summers with what you have learned here, even though you intend to go to college, you know? And that's another mindset. But it is, it is individualized, it's the child. You know, how do they learn? Do they learn better sitting down every day, every day of the year in a classroom? Or do they like to work with their hands? Or is there something that really interests them and that's what the tech does? And yes, I think, and high schools are starting to do it. I know Tewksbury is too. They're starting to bring back some of the comprehensive programs. Because, you know, I mean, we can only accept a little over 1,200 students or whatever at the tech. And from five towns, that's not that many students. Right. So, yes, the high schools have to come back to comprehensive. They have to think of some things, you know, that'll that'll keep their children interested. See, and that's the big thing with schools this day, today. It's how do you keep the kids on task? How do you keep them interested? Even in the elementary, that's what they're having the hardest time with. You know, we need to keep these kids on task. How do we do it? What do we have to do to? interest them. It's no longer the sit down, shut up, this is your classroom like we all lived in before. Right. It's just not that anymore. So yeah, schools have to change. And you know, I, I'm going to tell you a funny story about, um, it was about 10 years ago, because I'm on the Shashin Tech School Committee, I have been able to go to a lot of um, national meetings. And I'm sitting here with someone from Alaska, from the school, actually he was a superintendent from from a town in Alaska, and I was telling him, you know, about the technical school, and he went, you do what? <laughs> and I said, yeah, this is what we do. He goes, I've never heard of that. And I said, yeah, well, you know, and he was amazed, at like, oh, so we can educate those children that have a hard time with, you know, every week in and out at a, sitting at a desk. We can do that. And I'm like, yeah, because there's a lot of schools like this. And you know, so it's just a different type of education and it, it has to appeal to the student. It sure. has to. Sure. Um, and, and I guess so along those lines, not to put words in your mouth right. by any stretch, but uh, it sounds like that you probably don't feel as though the, the common core curriculum is, is probably the best route to go? I have an issue with I mean, we have, had, we have probably the best schools in the country in Massachusetts. Sure. So when the government says, oh, we should do Common Core and everyone should do it and we'll give you money for it, and the state goes, okay, we'll go with it. And it's like, why? Tell them they have to match us. Right. You know? <laughs> why do we match? And that's my thing about mimicking, you know, other states. And It's like, we have the best. Why are we changing? You know, we should not change it. I mean, I just looked at, you know, I'm on um, the curriculum subcommittee at the tech, and, you know, the scoring now is like crazy. You know, they've totally changed the scoring. It hasn't totally got, come into effect, but, you know, with the MCAS scores, all five towns are pretty similar. And, you know, and now you're looking at this, however they do it, the accountability, it's like, what's going on? How did you figure that out? And I actually have a meeting next week where they're going to explain to me how <laughs> they got those scores. You know, I mean, it, it's crazy. Um, this is a question that was touched on a little bit the other night. Okay. Um, the, uh, a lot has changed in Massachusetts over the last 10 years. Um, legalized uh, recreational marijuana coming yeah. into play now. Um, and uh, expanded uh, casino gambling mm -hmm. and now recent court decision legalizing um, sports gambling and whatnot. Now all of this stuff is going to bring in, odds are hundreds of millions of dollars in supposedly. tax revenue. <laughs> right, supposedly. <laughs> but my question is, 
is that additional revenue, and, and, and heaven knows the state could use it, right. but is that additional revenue um, worth it? Is it worth having these, these things right. legalized gambling, legalized marijuana? If I go back to the slots parlor in Tuxbury, sure. and I was on the committee to stop that because we thought it would change the culture of our town. And and that's when, you, you know, you do need to look at that. What about the culture of your state? Do you really want it to change that much? You know, is money worth it? I mean, just like the poll in South Tuxbury that they put up, you know, and for like Verizon or whoever they did oh, it the for. Oh, right. yeah, right. Uh, right. yeah. And I was the only one at town meeting who got up against that. And, you know, and at the time it was going to bring in like, I don't know, thousand bucks or something a year for the town. And everybody's like, yeah, yeah. And as soon as they started building it, all the people in South Tuxbury said, what the heck is that? <laughs> you know? And I said, oh, that's the cell phone tower that they voted on. Which they were supposed to take down 10 years later, but it's not done yet. But that's another issue. <laughs> um, but, you know, and that's, you know, but like the marijuana thing, it was voted on by the people. So, you know, you have to respect the people's opinion. And I don't like it. And Tewksbury is in a unique position because Tewksbury did not vote for it. Right. You know, so we have the right to decide if, you know, we really want it or not. And so that's what we had, you know, quite a discussion at town meeting about that. And, you know, and like slots parlors or whatever, again, you know, people want them, but I think people want them in certain areas where they don't bother anyone, sure. you know? Sure. I mean, just like, you know, the detox centers and stuff, it's like, you know, we need them, you know, we need, you know, we need these places for these people, but where are we going to put them? Because right. I don't want them in my neighborhood. Right. You know, and maybe you should think that before you vote <laughs> for these things, you know, maybe it'll show up in your neighborhood, right. not the detox centers, because they're needed, but, you know, like gambling casinos or medical marijuana shop, not medical marijuana, recreational marijuana right. shops. And take, and take a ride, you know, not a ride, but go to, um, you know, Denver. Right. You know, see what you think. Do you, do you like it? I've been to Denver, you know, and everybody's like, yeah. it was a nice place. And I really didn't notice it, but others, you know, but other people say, right. did you really like it? I said, everybody's happy. <laughs> <laughs> So I you know I think that's something that the voters need to really think about. And are we really going to get that much money from it? You know, and that's the other thing because they always say we're going to get so much money. You know, they do all these things. They, you know, like um, the excise tax was pay for our cars and stuff. Oh, it's going to pay for the roads. Oh, it's going to do this and, that. and then it's like, oh, we have no money for the roads. Oh, we have no money. Oh, what would you do with the money? Oh, we use it here. It's like, that's not what the money was for. And maybe <laughs> what they should do is like, okay, that money coming from the casinos is going directly into something like education. Or something. Sure. Maybe that's what we need to think about. You know, we need to say where it's going, and then people say, okay, I see the improvement. But other than that, most of the time you don't see it. Right. This is the first time in quite a while that you have participated in a um, contested. Race. No, you, you, six years ago. Two, okay. Two, six years. <laughs> um, and uh, so you've had a chance now to to go around to the communities of Wilmington and, and took spray and talk to a lot of people. What are you hearing uh, from the people you've talked to? Are what are the biggest concerns on on people's minds? What's at the top of their priority list? The roads. Really? No, the it's it's the lights on the streets it's the roads it's like and a lot of it isn't something that really is something that is a state issue it's more like you know a town issue like all the buildings all you know why are they building so much why are they doing this the roads and, but I would try to get funding that particularly addresses the state roads in our towns I mean we all know 38 is a mess. I mean, if you ride down and you're going back and forth, you look like, you know, right. you should be arrested because you're avoiding all the <laughs> holes in the road. You know, it's like, I'm just avoiding the hole. So, you know, that, you know, we really need that 
And those are, that's really the biggest issue. I had a, a meeting a couple weeks ago, and that's it. And I said, well, what are you going to do about the light over there? Or why don't we have a light here? Mm -hmm. why, or look at the road here. Look at the exit coming off of 93. Terrible. We can't get off, you know, like at 62 in Wilmington or... You know, I mean, they're like, exit 42, exit this. And I'm like, not enough lighting, not enough this. I'm like, okay, anything else you'd like to say? <laughs> but, you know, I think it's because we're thinking about our own lives. Sure. This, this affects Absolutely. us every single day. Right. The bigger issues, except for the opioid crisis, which affected, affects all of us, because we all know someone who has, you know, overdosed. We all know this, and, you know, so it's... So that really has to be addressed, and you know, and people are aware of that. But right. It's mostly town issues that they're really looking at. Excellent, excellent. Um, all right, we appreciate the time. Okay. If, uh, if people want to find out more about you, more mm -hmm. about your campaign, where can they find out that information? Okay, I do have a website. It's M E U S E, the number four, state rep. Um, dot com <laughs> okay. and, and then my gmail account is the same use for state rep at gmail.com all right and you can always call me at 978-658-5339 i you know i i did say in one of my things i i'm like mccoy i don't like robocalls so i may not pick up but I, if you leave me a message i will respond <laughs> <laughs> excellent well we've been talking with patty news uh, candidate unenrolled candidate uh, for a state representative 19th Middlesex District. We appreciate you taking the time All to right. talk with us. Okay, thank you.